Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar on webinars. Uh, as for several of our past uh, webinars, uh, this one is co-organized by GFAR, the Global Forum on Agriculture Research and Innovation, um, and the Global Landscapes Forum, GLF, which is a project from the Center for International Forestry Research, C4. As usual, we have partnered up with uh, other institutions and affiliated organizations, uh, members of our, of our GLF uh, GFAR community, and also some representatives uh, from the private sector. Uh, these webinars are a typical example of how we put the GFAR collective actions into practice and act as a, a mediator between uh, different uh, parties. Um, also for um, GLF, uh, through what they call digital summits, um, they use these webinars to engage with their constituency. Uh, during this webinar, April Thompson and uh, David Thomas uh, will be facilitating the process and your questions, and they will do some of the backend uh, technical support. Uh, as usual, we are pledging to the God of Connectivity, the Goddess uh, of Technology, and the Emperor of the Internet to keep us connected for the next 90 minutes. But before we start, a word on the logistics of this webinar. Uh, for this webinar, uh, we're all connected through a service called BlueJeans. Uh, which allows everyone to see and hear the speakers. Feedback, tips, and questions should only be done via the chat box. So please keep your uh, video and your audio muted. Um, I see Helen is broadcasting video. If you could please uh, um, mute your video, uh, Helen. Thank you. Uh, and please keep your audio and your video muted as a participant. Otherwise, it will suck up a lot of bandwidth from everyone and interfere with our chats. Even though, as usual, we are uh, with a really big group, uh, we had 180 registrations for this webinar, I would still uh, like to use this session to be as interactive as possible. So for the first um, hour, uh, we will run through some questions we prepared as presenters to give you a good and deep overview of why and how we do uh, webinars. Um, Helen, could you please uh, mute your uh, video, yeah. Helen? Thank you. Um, for the first hour, we will run through some questions which we prepared as presenters to give you a good and deep overview of why and how we do webinars, some of the tools, some of the performance measures we use, some of our experiences we want to share. So I do encourage you, uh, the public, to uh, send remarks, questions, and suggestions already during our first part where we go through our pre-prepared questions. Uh, you can do this using the chat box, which is the icon you can find on the top right hand, hand side of your window. During the webinar, David will collect your questions and pitch them to April. And we also have a longer Q&A session in the last 30 minutes of this webinar. After this webinar, I will send you a mail with a link to the recording of the webinar, some links to websites or resources we might have mentioned uh, during the webinar, or the answers to questions we could not answer during the webinar itself. Uh, today, our webinar is all about webinars, the webinar about webinars. Uh, many of you have been involved as participants in past GFAR uh, webinars or GLF Digital Summit. Over the past years, um, we have seen how webinars can be used uh, for many different purposes, connecting and involving an online audience in, rel in a relatively cheap and easy way. So today, we want to share our experiences in preparing, setting up and running a webinar, covering the processes, the tools, uh, what we have learned along the way with our successes and failures. So if you are thinking of using webinars for your work, you can have a bit of a head start and not go to the uh, startup pains that we have experienced uh, with blood, sweat and tears. We have seven speakers and two moderators today. Our speakers are Kathleen Freeman, um, uh, working for CCAFs, uh, joining us from Colorado. Um, Amy Maron, working for ICAA, joining us from Peru. Pier Andrea Pirani, um, working for Euphoric Services, joining us from Kuala Lumpur. Uh, Leandra Kuri, uh, who is a freelance working with Stellenbosch University, uh, joining us from South Africa. Uh, Kelly McDonald and Judy McCarthy, working for USAID and USAID projects, joining us from Washington DC, if I remember well. And then I'm joining you um, from Rome, and I work for GFAR and GLF. The speakers will introduce themselves, um, and April, you can go on unmute at the moment. Um, but I would like to introduce the two moderators. April Thomas has more than 10 years of experience in uh, knowledge management, uh, marketing, communications, and capacity building in international development. April current, currently serves as a knowledge management portfolio manager for the QED group on the USAID Feed the Future Knowledge Driven Agriculture Development Project, 
KDAD. April um, will be our panel moderator and facilitator. Um, David Thomas um, is our second moderator. He is a multifaceted development specialist, an entrepreneur and facilitator. He is the founder and director of Danaka World Chick, an innovative um, ethical um, market access company with a retail outlet in West London. David joins us uh, through his work at the Center for International Forestry Research, C4, where he is also the lead facilitator and engagement specialist for the Global Landscapes Forum, GLF. David Thomas will uh, collect the online questions and work with uh, April to guide us through this webinar. So let's get this show on the road. Um, while I would like our audience to please keep um, their audio and the video muted, I would like our panel to unmute their video while I hand over the floor to April. April, it's all yours. Please take it away. Thanks, Peter. It's great to see everyone online here from so many time zones and um, with such diverse experience, including our panel. Um, so to kick it off, we just like to, to get to know our panel a little better. Um, I think we're still waiting for folks to unmute their videos here. So um, um, in no particular order, I'd like to hear from all of you um, just a couple words about yourself where you're dialing in from today, um, the organization um, you're with, and the kinds of webinars you, you are currently organized or, or have organized in the past. Um, Peter, why don't we kick it off with you? Uh, okay, <laughs> thank you. I was trying to see who else I needed to mute. Um, uh, thanks, uh, April. Well, my name is Peter Kazi. I'm a freelance uh, online media consultant. Um, in the past years, I organized and uh, facilitated quite a few webinars for different organizations. These webinars we've used in the past for online training, uh, online learning events or mentoring sessions, um, a way to get input for sessions, preparing physical events such as conferences, and giving up interest for those uh, events and preparing them online. Uh, we've also used them to elaborate on past events and conferences uh, to follow up um, in online discussions what we discussed at past conferences. Apart from content, we also use it, of course, uh, in a way to keep our constituencies and members and our partners engaged in issues pertinent to our organizations. We've also used webinar tools for larger scale teleconferences with uh, 20, 30 people, typically where Skype cannot handle it well. April, back to you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, here, Andrea, hopefully I'm pronouncing uh, your name properly. Here. Yes, thanks very much, April. Uh, it's great to be here. So this is uh, Pierre Andrea from uh, Euphoric Services. As Peter said before, I'm based. I'm calling in from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Um, Euphoric Services is a tiny, I would say, consulting company. We work in and around uh, knowledge, communication, and learning. Um, and we've been uh, um, running and facilitating hosted webinars for our for our clients, such as the uh, Building Demand for Sanitation program of the Gates Foundation, um, the Collaborative Adaptation Research uh, in Africa and Asia, CARIA, um, D-Groups, uh, CTA, uh, Deeple Foundation. Um, in a way, the events we've been running are very similar to what Peter has, uh, Peter has described, so really from uh, always learning and, and sharing events, uh, from online trainings uh, uh, to more, if you want, participatory uh, meetings, such as online peer exchanges or even uh, online open spaces. Um, so um, that's that's more or less about the type of uh, of events, uh, and in general, in terms of my roles, my role has always been in terms of producing, uh, and producing, preparing, and and facilitating. Um, probably one uh, um, one additional way we've been running webinars is to try to blend online and face to face. So not so much in terms of web conference and webcasting, but really to extend extend the face to face event to online participants. Uh, so trying to, in a way, replicate uh, um, the dynamics that were happening in a face-to-face -face workshop in an online environment, and then being able to um, do cross-harvesting between the two, the two spaces, um, which is very interesting, but yes, very challenging, technically and also in terms of process. Um, I will stop here for the moment and hand it over back to you, April. Great. Look forward to hearing more from you throughout the, the session. Um, Leandra? Let's, uh, let's hear from you. What, what are you doing with webinars? Hi, um, I'm from South Africa um, and I've worked with the webinars both for meetings and teaching purposes. Um, the meetings were 
um, with a corporate company um, to organize uh, meetings for internal people from around the country. Um, at the moment, I'm involved with teaching webinars with Stellenbosch University, where we are targeting the Eastern Cape, which is um, a more rural area, and trying to include um, the remote areas within the Western Cape into our webinars and using them as a teaching session. Um, we um, have the presenter and then polls, uh, questions and answers. Um, so that's that's what we're doing at the moment with webinars. Interesting. Thank you. Um, next, let's hear from Kelly. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kelly McDonald, and I am a knowledge management coordinator for USAID's multi-sectoral nutrition project, SPRING. So I actually work for SPRING and not USAID. But um, on SPRING, as the KM coordinator, I host a variety of different webinars. Um, we have some internal webinars that focus on learning and sharing um, our lessons learned from our project. And then we also have a lot of external webinars and kind of just seconding what others have said so far. Um, the, these external webinars are really to connect a global audience. Um, because we're an international project, we have audience members from all around the world. So that's it for now. And I'll get more into it later on. Great. Yeah, we, we work a fair amount with spring. Um, I should have mentioned um, it wasn't part of my um, introduction, but um, I, with uh, Julie McCarthy, who we're going to hear from next, um, help run the AgriLinks and MicroLinks webinars. So we've uh, gotten some great material from you, Kelly. Um, Julie, let's hear from you next. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Julie McCarty, and I'm with the U.S. Agency for International Development with the Bureau for Food Security. Uh, I've been working on webinars for over six years, but this is actually my first time doing a video-based webinar and seeing myself on the screen, so that'll be a fun new experience for me to get used to. Um, so I specifically focus on knowledge sharing and learning uh, at the Bureau for Food Security, and a big part of that is using webinars as a tool uh, to help promote that knowledge sharing and learning, um, both among all of the USAID missions around the world and among all of our uh, development practitioners who are implementing projects globally. And so the main webinar series I've been working on, uh, which is about six years old now, is called the AgriLinks uh, webinar series. It's the flagship mm -hmm. webinar series for the Bureau for Food Security. And um, it's really a, a series that aims to bring really topics that are of interest to the agricultural development and food security community uh, to the forefront with the goal of improving implementation around the world and giving some of those actionable tips and messages that can help everyone um, improve their programming. So um, yeah, so that's, that's the Wayne webinar series I work on. And I also do a number of internal webinars for USAID, uh, training-based webinars for the field, um, some Q&As with experts, things like that. So that is all. Thanks, Julie. Um, Kath Lee. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, or it's morning for me. I'm in uh, the US right now. I work for CCAFs, um, and I am a communications consultant, so I manage a lot of different communication outputs, but one of them is webinars. Um, and so most of it, most of what I do for CCAFs is really research dissemination, um, but I've also worked with it for meetings and trainings um, both internally and externally. Um, so kind of echoing what everyone else has said, we're an international organization. Um, so we really rely on webinars to have meetings that just wouldn't be feasible um, if we were to uh, try to do conference calls or Skype or things like that. So that's been my experience with webinars. Thank you. And last but not least, Amy. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm calling in from Quito, Ecuador. I am currently a freelance uh, knowledge management and capacity building consultant. And as um, Peter mentioned in the introduction, I'm going to share um, mainly the experience I have from organizing and facilitating over 60 webinars in Spanish in um, Latin America on the context of USAID funded initiative for conservation in the Andean Amazon. So we were connecting many people that were in remote locations. This was a program that was working across four countries. And 
it involved connecting to varied audiences from government officials to conservationists to researchers and um and it was um i think something unique about it was the language component for sure and um <clears throat> and also uh just as some other people were were mentioning the the connectivity issues with connecting people from the Amazon, for example. Great, thank you. Um, so already um, we can kind of see just the the the, the breadth of um, ways that people are using webinars and 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 why um, from um, instruction to being sort of another moment on a learning continuum where. Um, maybe some in-person exchange has taken place. Um, one way um, passage of information versus peer-to-peer -peer exchanges. Um, so I, I guess the, the next question would, would be, and, and we'll just pitch this to a few of you, um, kind of um, looking at the technology side of things, which um, of course in some ways is a means to an end, but also shapes the user experience and what you're, you're able to do with a webinar. Um, so, um, Ellie, let, let, let's hear from you. What, um, what webinar tools um, have you used or are you currently using and, and, and what are some of the pros and cons? Um, why did you select the tool that, that, uh, that you did in a particular situation? Um, so let's, let's hear from Kelly on that first. Okay, so as I mentioned before, we have two different types of webinars. Um, so we use two different technologies. We use Adobe Connect for a lot of our um, spring webinars. And then Spring also helps um, run like the egg to new community of practice. So for that, we took on a more, um, a more uh, interactive webinar. So we use uh, the platform WebEx. Um, so we use these two different webinars because we work as kind of April and Julie had mentioned, um, at the intersection of nutrition and food security. So we have an audience that spans around the globe, so obviously we need to find a way to, to connect everyone. So we use our webinar platforms um, to connect researchers, implementers, and we do so in order to learn from one another and hopefully accelerate the innovation and put what we've learned, all the evidence we've gathered into practice. Um, and any pros and cons to, I mean, I, uh, we, we work on Adobe Connect too, and, and I, I can say a few offhand, I'd be curious to hear what, what your experience has been on that. Yeah, so um, a lot of the webinars we've run, you know, you always, as even Peter had mentioned, we uh, pray to the connectivity gods before every web webinar. But Adobe Connect is really nice, and we tend to use that more than WebEx, just because it seems a little more professional. Um, it's a little bit more intuitive and allows for more flexibility in hosting. We really like the ability to customize the meeting room based on the needs of our audience and the presenters that are joining us. And in Adobe Connect, you can do, you can you can do this all in real time. And when something goes wrong in the webinar, Adobe Connect has like a what's it called present. Uh, presentation, wait, no, prepare mode, sorry, <laughs> prepare mode, so you can kind of like freeze the screen for the audience, but you can go behind the scenes, and if you need to fix the layout, or if you uploaded the wrong file, for example, you can all fix that. So we really appreciate the ability to segment, segment the presenters and the audiences in Adobe Connect, um, and coordinate a little bit more behind the curtains, so to speak. Um, we have like our own uh, chat pod between just the presenters and the hosts that the the general audience, the public can't see. Whereas in WebEx, everything is kind of out in the open, more like the we the webinar platform we're on now, BlueJeans. Great. Um, how about um, Leandra? What what are you um, serving your webinars on? Um. Okay, well, um, I have used Adobe Connect in the past. Um, that was for the um, meeting webinars. Um, I do like um, Adobe Connect very much. Um, I find it is one of the better tools. Um, but at Stellenbosch University, um, I unfortunately was limited to using what is available at the university. 
Um, so we, I could, I had a choice between video and Skype for business. Um, I did use video for the first webinar that we ran, which was a total disaster, which I can tell you about later. <laughs> and um, we've been using Skype for business since. I found that it's really a nice system because um, the most of the um, participants, they are, um, as I mentioned earlier, in the Eastern Cape in Amtata, and the um, Wi-Fi connection is very, is bad to non-existent. So um, the bandwidth issues, Skype for Business is very, um, it's, it's favorable to those conditions. And um, if the participants don't have Skype for Business, the web app is very easy to download. Um, so you don't have to have Skype for Business, which is a great advantage. Um, it's, with video, I found that people battle to download the web app, but Skype for Business the web app downloads on all devices, Android, um, iPhone, tablets, uh, desks, windows. Um, but the only problem is that when we run a poll, um, we found that the polls aren't visible on the tablets. So that's one of the problems we found. But um, with Skype for Business, you're able to have a whiteboard where you can e draw and explain, um, run polls, questions and answers. So our webinars are more medically orientated against around biostats. So you do need to have a bit of explanation because of the, the, the subject matter. Great. Um, yeah, you've got the right, select the right tool for what you're trying to do and um, bandwidth does matter. It's interesting to hear about Skype for Business. I haven't actually used that and didn't realize that it had so many um, different uh, features to it. Yeah, I hadn't used it before and I've only used ordinary Skype and Skype for Business is great because I um, initiate the Skype calls and that gives me a lot of um, um, control as the um, person running it. I can mute people, I can um, promote people to presenters. So it is has a few features of Adobe Connect but it's not as powerful as Adobe Connect, but it does give you a lot of power compared to other webinar software such as WebEx and BlueJeans. So yeah, it is actually a very powerful tool. Great. Um, okay. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and um, move on to uh, the next question. And I want to remind everyone um, to use the chat if you have um, a question that you want to, to throw to the panel, um, and uh, my my uh, co-moderator here will will um, will will dive in with that. Um, we'll have plenty of time at the end, as well as um, a little bit throughout. So um, so do um, share your questions via the chat box. Um, so next, I just want to um, hear a little bit. I I know people have um, different ways that they're using webinars so this question may not apply to everyone but where you get your material for those of us who are doing webinar series where we're calling on um, external uh, presenters to um, present on a given topic and and um, and also kind of what are some of the pitfalls in dealing with um, presenters and, and their um, their their presentations how they're presenting the material let's say um, so Pierre um, let's go to you first Thank you, April. Uh, yes, as I was saying in my introduction, we mostly do hosted webinars, so that means we run them for our clients. So the process of uh, identifying suitable speakers, it's, it's more up to them, let's say. Uh, where we come in, uh, it's really in the uh, design of the event, so working with the speaker to design the event, to design the intervention, how they want to uh, present what they want to present, and really to craft the content. Um, Presenting online is very different than presenting face-to-face. -face. Uh, so what, where we try to spend uh, uh, a good amount of time, it's working with them really to craft the presentation that they will have to deliver online. Um, so for example, to try to make them more visual, to try to have uh, uh, one concept per slides instead of more concept per slides and have more frequent 
change of slides, right, to retain the attention um, of, of the audience. Um, and so it's, it's coaching in the, in the design of the presentation, but also uh, coaching in the uh, presentation itself. And that's why the practice and the dry run, it's really it's essential for them to understand the platform, but also understand how to uh, deliver a presentation um, in an effective way. Um, and I think uh, this is, for me, this is uh, really, really important uh, to have uh, um, a good uh, a good webinar. I always like when, when presentations are short and then there is more time for conversation and discussions uh, in the panel or with the participants. Um, and, and so that's, for me, it's, uh, it's a, key, a, key, a key element uh, uh, in working with the presenter. Of course, yes, no, uh, the challenge is, is that you know, we need, you need to find time to work with them and everybody, you know, is always in a hurry. So it's always difficult to plan enough time uh, to have uh, um, uh, to have as much preparation as, as you would like to have. Um, and yes, and also to get them into, like I was saying before, the habit of presenting in a different way, through a different medium, let's put it this way. Yeah, Thank that you. can definitely be a challenge. Um, those, are, those are some great tips for sure. Um, how about, how about, um, Let's uh, let's hear from Kathleen on that. All right. Um, so I'm probably going to echo a lot of things that was just um, that were just said. Um, usually, when we put together webinars, um, it's to disseminate knowledge, and so um, we'll organize it around uh, specific projects. We just did one on science policy dialogue. Um, so that kind of makes it easy to find speakers. Um, at CCAPS, we have a really, obviously, a really great network of um, people doing some really great projects. So we usually pull um, speakers from those um, arenas. Um, and some pitfalls, some general pitfalls. Um, there's putting together the dry run. Um, finding time for everybody is always an issue. Um, and we try really hard to get presentations ahead of time, at least a few days, but that doesn't always um, work well. Uh, so, but those are some of the issues with speakers. And then also during the presentation, um, you know, we're usually organizing what we'll be talking about and the theme. Um, and so making sure that presentations actually fit that theme well. Um, and then during the webinars, um, making sure that everybody is comfortable and when people have uh, technology glitches, making sure that we kind of iron those out. and. Echoing what was just said, that's when the um, practice run really helps a lot. Um, and then also, I think having a really good moderator um, is really beneficial, especially if you have technology issues or if you have uh, speakers that um, are going over time limits, to have somebody who can really easily smooth those issues out um, is really beneficial. Yes, absolutely. Um, I. Um, I think we actually have a <laughs> sort of philosophical question from the audience, um, and this is a, a wild card for anyone who wants to answer. Someone um, asked a more basic question: What um, what exactly do we mean by a webinar, and um, how how is that differentiated from other tools? Um, does someone want to uh, dive in with uh, their definition of, of a webinar and how how it's different from from other kinds of I guess online um, interactions? <laughs> Um, you want me to have a go at it, April? Sure. Uh, well, for me, a, a webinar um, uh, is a tool where you can connect multiple interactive uh, parties. So it's different from web streaming, where we did um, a different uh, webinar on uh, about a month ago, which is basically broadcasting um, uh, from one point to multiple. Um, webinar is turning that uh, upside down, where multiple parties can interactively uh, interact um, uh, either via voice, via um, video, or uh, via the chat box as we do right now. Uh, so for me, webinar is, is a tool to connect multiple parties um, at the same time uh, with a certain purpose, uh, be it uh, as a learning experience, as a, um, uh, um, uh, a mentoring experience, um, as um, an online training, uh, experience, or as I mentioned before, we use it a lot to prepare uh, conferences, sessions at conferences, or to spin up at the conferences. Go ahead, April. Great. Um, I think that's a the great definition. Thanks. Um, and and webinars, for example, um, you know, with uh, some of the webinars we do, um, they they can also be blended with in-person events too. So 
we will have um, you know a, a live audience uh, with speakers, but um, also have people tuning in remotely, and we'll have uh, questions uh, from a live audience as well as online. Um, so um, it doesn't necessarily mean a webinar only, too. Um, so um, I um, everyone. Uh, Loves a good failure, and and I think it's important to learn from our failures. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure we've all had them. I can think of one webinar, for example, where um, we um, we as the presenters were in the wrong room. We had we had sent the um, the entire audience, um, and I'm I want to say it was you know a good 150 people or so um, to a, a room, and we're kind of waiting like, huh, this is unusual that we don't have people showing up, and kind of realized it. And uh, luckily, it had a um, uh, an AV technician who was um, on the spot and managed to get us into the, the, the right room and quickly scrambled to, to get the presentations up there rather than trying to move 150 people, <laughs> which uh, doesn't really work so well. So uh, next question, um, and Peter, since you're up here, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna lob it over to you first. Um, tell, tell me about a time where uh, a webinar uh, went south uh, what you did and kind of what you learned from it or maybe, you know, how you changed your process as a result. Well, you know, I'm uh, touching wood here. Uh, we never really had a complete flop uh, so far, um, but we had a couple of close calls and, and most of them are related to pure, simple technical issues. Um, as the, an example, as the main facilitator for uh, the webinars that um, uh, we organize, uh, once my internet died 30 minutes before um, um, a webinar. Uh, so I had to run off and, and uh, go actually to Biodiversity International, just um, uh, five minutes away from here, and start everything up again. Um, I think um, most of the potential dangers that we have is for presenters um, not having a good connection or not being properly uh, technically prepared. So um, what we do is we have uh, all presenters uh, run a connectivity self-test with our tool. Then we have a dry run, a test run to basically test their setup and make them feel comfortable with the technical tool. Um, and we asked them also before the webinar, as you've seen with the, this webinar, to connect minimum 15 minutes before we start the webinar to make sure that there is, at least amongst the presenters, there is no technical uh, connectivity issue or audio issue or uh, video issue. Um, so the main, the main issues that we have with webinars is basically connectivity. And um, our prayer is always that the presenters can stay online in um, uh, good quality audio and video uh, throughout the whole webinar. Back to you, April. Thanks. Yeah. Testing, planning, and having contingency plans, I think, um, are, are definitely key in, in, in trying to look ahead at some of the problems that can happen. But it's amazing, you know, what, you know, every time you think you've got everything, you know, buttoned down, you, you find that one... Uh, Vulnerability sometimes that you didn't realize you had, like uh, the like the room thing. <laughs> that was a new one. Um, let's see. How about um, over to uh, to you, Julie? I'm sorry, Hi, Julie hadn't s signed up for that one necessarily. Oh. Although if you if you've got a <laughs> something to share, <laughs> um, actually, uh, no, I'd rather stick to the ones that I. Signed up for since I know that a few other people did have some failures that they sure. wanted to promote. <laughs> um, okay, how about Leandra? So our first um, webinar. So well, maybe I should explain first that um, webinars in this unit um, at Stellenbosch University is a very new concept. So I was bringing in something very new. Um, the first um, of a series of 10 webinars that we ran, we used video. Um, the presenter and myself were very busy at the time and we didn't give, um, we actually didn't pay enough attention to prep um, and the presenter was still busy with her presentation an hour before the time. I'd asked her to have it ready a few days beforehand, but um, up until a few minutes before the webinar started, she was still making changes. Um, and um, I was, I'd asked the um, participants to download the um, 
um, app um, to join in a few days beforehand, but everybody started about 10 minutes before the webinar. Um, there were lots of issues. Uh, um, people couldn't download the app. Um, it was one of the most frustrating apps to try and download. Um, eventually, we got everybody downloaded. Um, and then the presenter was very nervous, so had too many people in the room with her. And so anytime anyone walked, they walked behind her. So all you got was movement behind her. Um, and also we were um, planning to record these sessions so that we can put them on the website so that people who couldn't join can connect at a later stage. And we forgot to press the record button. Um, and then, just to top it off, during the presentation, she hadn't sent it to me as backup. She was just starting. Her computer started to do an upgrade, update, and we couldn't stop it. The computer stopped. We had to restart the computer and um, then restart the webinar. So, yeah, it was. A, I would say that was a complete and total failure. Um, and after that, we moved to Skype for Business, and I learned a lot of lessons. <laughs> and oh. <back> to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, sounds like Murphy's Law was in effect there. Um, and it's hard because um, some of those things maybe you, you could have controlled for, and, and some things not. And it's hard when you know you've got a timeline and you've done your planning and. Um, People will do other things than what they tell you, you know, what, what they've been tasked to do. So um, I guess that's where, again, like having some sort of uh, contingency plans um, to, to try to um, account for that. Um, let's see. How about um, let, let's hear from from Amy on that that question before we move on to the next. Sure. Amy. Um, yep. <laughs> so yeah. one of one of the thing, one of the particular circumstances that I remember is, you prepare. You know, as people have said, you you prepare your speakers. You do um, sound checks. You do connectivity checks. Well, I I had a particular case where one of my speakers didn't alert me to the fact that she was going to be traveling, and so we did a test. But then she was in a very different location <laughs> than she was when we did the test. She was in Cuba, and um, as probably many know, the connectivity issues in Cuba are um, pretty extreme. And so yes. <laughs> she was our one and only presenter. And for, fortunately, this was an internal event, but it did not work at all. And so what we ended up having to do was, because the people had blocked off a time and it was part of a capacity um, building mm -hmm. group, we ended up, I ended up having to do a session independently with her where she literally was presenting to me and we recorded it and I had to send it out to the participants and then they sent any questions back because um, they needed to do it. We needed to be respectful of their agendas. So that was a workaround that we came up with. It was not ideal at all because it wasn't very interactive, but um, this is, you know, this is what we had to do because of technology fails, fail, and mm -hmm. so. That's uh, an underappreciated skill is being able to think on your feet in these situations, because uh, <laughs> yeah, you can't think everything through. So um, we uh, we got a question online. I want to just kind of uh, throw this out to whomever um, wants to dive in, and um, it's a good one. Um, how do we integrate good uh, facilitation within a webinar? So it's just not you know when presentation after um, the next without kind of, you know, helping uh, synthesizing the, the learning between it. Um, anyone want to take that on? I can, uh, sorry, this is Julie, and I see Piers also um, raising his hand, so perhaps both of us could um, chime in on this one. Um, sure. Facilitation is, um, we definitely believe at USAID and, and with the AgriLinks webinars that facilitation is a really key, important piece of the webinar. Um, and the facilitation is really important for audience engagement. And ultimately, a webinar really is about, it's not about us as the host, right? It's not about the presenter so much as it's about the audience and what they need. And I think the facilitator is a very key link, you know, between all of the behind the scenes presentation part and um, 
and the audience. And so uh, typically for an AgriLinks webinar, we'll have sort of a three person team who's running the webinar. We'll have um, the AV tech who in his own right is a facilitator, um, you know, kind of keeping everyone uh, you know, handled as, as far as their AV issues might go. And then we'll have the verbal facilitator, such as what April is doing today. And then um, an additional fa facilitator who is focused solely on the chat box engagement, um, which we also have on the webinar today. And I think having, um, it's hard for just one person to do all three of those roles at the same time, which is what I think some people try to do uh, mm -hmm. when they're first starting up a webinar, just have one person handling every aspect of facilitation. And so to me, one of the key tips is sometimes it's best to break out some of those roles and responsibilities for a facilitator, almost having a checkbox on, on the side, um, knowing what you are responsible for. Of course, you may have to jump in and perform another facilitator's role um, if they get disconnected or, or something happens. Um, and then we, we've also sometimes even brought in an additional um, uh, what we like to call a, a chat box engager or chat box commentator, someone who's an expert in the actual subject area of mm. the webinar, um, who can really help um, spur discussion among the participants. Since the facilitator isn't always an expert on the content of the webinar. Um, in this case, we do have uh, some expert facilitators, but that can't always be the case. And so bringing on that extra person who can um, you know, really elicit chat and responses from the participants. Great tip. Thanks. Um, was that Pierre that's also uh, yep. interested in responding? There we go. Yes. So yeah, I fully um, I fully subscribe to what Julie just said. And in fact, the larger team you have, the better, I guess. Uh, uh, there is always need for extra help, I think. Um, in my experience, the facilitation really depends on the design that you um, produce your, your webinar around. Um, so um, like uh, I made some example before, and, that, and the design also allows you to, uh, if you want, break out of the sequence of presentation and Q&A, right, and have a bit more of interactive um, a gig. Um, I made the example before of uh, uh, online peer exchange, so uh, where it's actually the presenter asking, at the end, it's a presenter asking questions to the audience, right, peer, peer assistant or peer exchange. Um, and uh, we, uh, we did, I see Nancy, Nancy's in the room, we did uh, some fun experiment uh, uh, a couple of years back uh, in the try to blend uh, uh, online and face-to-face. -face. Um, one thing that, uh, uh, I, as many of you, I also use Adobe Connect. Uh, uh, and in the design and the facilitation of webinars, I, as much as possible, try to use the feature of breakout rooms. Uh, so you have a presentation with all uh, audience uh, uh, in plenary, and then you break out participant in smaller in smaller rooms uh, for the conversation. In my experience, that has proved beneficial uh, in terms of uh, people uh, creating more intimate, if you want, uh, a situation uh, where people are less afraid to speak up. Um, and by default, when you are in a, in a breakout room in Adobe, the mic is open, you can start the video, so even the, the way to interact, it's at a different level. Uh, so in, to Republic, as, as I said, for me, the, the facilitation really depends on the design and how interactive you want the, 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 the webinar or the online meeting. Some tools allow you for more flexibility to reach this interactivity. Over to you, April. Great points, great points, yeah. Um, I, I think Peter also wanted to say a little more about facilitation and um, the, the, the preparatory stage. Yeah, uh, indeed, um, very often when people talk about facilitation, they think about the, um, the actual webinar um, itself, um, April. Um, so I would like to expand it a little bit <clears throat> that um, there is a need also for good facilitation in the preparation for it. So gathering the speakers, get, gathering the content expert, guiding them through the process. Um, otherwise, if people who have never um, organized um, a, a webinar as speaker um, um, or as content expert, uh, it gets very chaotic and they don't know the timeline, they don't understand that it all takes time to, to build it all up. And I think this is also one of the questions that we have is how do you prep um, uh, the speakers? So when I talk about, when I think about facilitation, it's not only during the webinar itself, but even more important, the whole preparation process uh, with the speakers and facilitating that process. Over to you, April. Okay, thanks. Um, and um, 
maybe that that's a, a good segue into a, a, a question that, that we had here around process um, sort of whether whether best practices in in um, in sort of the planning stage to, to make sure you have a successful webinar um, how uh, you know do you organize practice runs I mean it, it's of course ideal but you know we're often dealing with folks in lots of different time zones and busy schedules so um, so, so how, how do you how do you do that let's uh, hear from Leandra on this one so what we've had to do is um, we're working with um, doctors in hospitals so we've had to um, set up um, the webinars from about two o'clock in the afternoon to three thirty, um, and that's the the best time um, for the doctors because they've done their ward rounds, etc. So that's what we found works best for us. Um, then, with regards to prepping the presenters, um, each of the webinars is done by a different um, subject matter expert, and I try and get them to send me their presentations about a week before because a lot of them try and fit 100 slides into 90 minutes and so um, I then have to go and cut down on the number of slides and then what we do is I run about two practice runs with them with on the software hmm. um, so the first is getting them used to Skype for Business how it runs um, and then the second one is we go through the house rules, um, introducing themselves. Also, I run the polls. So I'm just getting them used to me running a poll and then, then uh, talking through the poll so that we don't have dead, air, dead silence. Um, and then bringing them back in with their presentations after I've run the poll. So I found that system works quite well in um, prepping them for the um, webinar. Um, I've seen, I just want to um, answer two questions that I saw in the chat. Um, with regards to Skype for Business, um, the university does have a license for all the staff and students and you, I create the webinar link for that specific meeting and then I send, the link is sent out to the participants. So if you've got that link, you can join just like today. Um, you join through a link. You don't have to, I don't register people. Um, the link is sent through to everyone. Thanks, April. Yeah, thank you. Um, how about Amy? Let's, let's hear about your process. Yeah, so um, I think there are two components, main components to the preparation phase that I think are really important to take into account. The promotion and registration that is with the audience. Um, so usually I was promoting and somebody did ask this question I saw and because I was promoting mainly for Latin, Latin American Spanish speaking audience. Um, the promotion that we did was via a listserv that we had, had established with a couple thousand subscribers and then we were also promoting via social media so via Twitter and Facebook primarily um, and in parallel with the um, people would be registering via in our case we did it usually via uh, SurveyMonkey for the registration although many of the um, applications or platforms do have a uh, built-in registration format um, the other thing that with the preparation for the speakers, we never used video because of the connectivity, because we had so many people connecting from the Amazon. So we always asked for a photo from our presenters up front. And what I would do is just add, like get their photo and I would add on the bottom their name. So that was always showing up in the right hand corner of the Adobe Connect platform, which is what we were using and with their, um, the presentation in the main screen to the left. Um, and then the other thing that we would always ask for is a bio, and um, as so many others were explaining, I also asked for the presentation up front. In the case of Adobe Connect, um, some many times when you upload the 
presentation, things shift around. And so it does involve a lot of um, making adjustments because if people have moved text outside of uh, the text boxes in, in PowerPoint, for example, mm -hmm. it creates, becomes a mess in, in Adobe Connect. So there is a lot of, um, although I think I really appreciated the format and the layout and the professionalism of Adobe Connect, there is more front end preparation, I would say, than some mm -hmm. other platforms where you're just viewing a PowerPoint, for example, from someone's shared screen or, so there's a little bit more movement and a little bit more um, playing around with formatting that's necessary in the preparation phase that I think is important to take into account. Um, and then I would always send a list of key tips to the presenters. So not only would we do a dry run, but it would be like, don't turn your, put your cell phone on silent or turn it off. Mm -hmm. I literally put a sign in my window because I had a glass window that I put, you know, in webinar, do not disturb on. Um, and I had like a little paper that I would always put up on my, <laughs> on my uh, little cabin that it was kind of like, so. Those are kind of some things that I learned along the way. Otherwise, people are knocking on your door, um, right. <laughs> not realizing that you're talking to a hundred people. Live. <laughs> so those are just a few things. Great, thanks. Um, so we we uh, we were planning to to discuss this, and someone asked about it in the chat, um, which is um, on on the marketing side. Um, you know how how do you how do you um, uh get people to your webinar how do you market it how do you get subscribers how do you build the base how do you spread the word um so uh maybe we can hear from kelly first on this one yes this is a great question because sometimes it the success of your webinar sometimes depends on how many people actually come so with the spring project we've grown an email to subscription list from zero to over seven thousand over the past six years um this serves is our primary dissemination vehicle, but we also disseminate to nutrition, public health, and global development listservs. We, just, we also try to reach out to communities of practice, and recently we've been focusing more on social media, including Twitter, Facebook, and then we actually sometimes use LinkedIn. Sometimes um, LinkedIn has those groups, so we look for a relevant group and might disseminate or make our announcement on there as well. Um, we found that like the uh, in terms of the process of dissemination, we found that beginning dissemination around three weeks before the webinar is is proven to um, give you more registration, but definitely no later than two weeks. Um, you really want people to be able to prepare if they have a different commitment, make time for this. Um, and then we'd set up our registration um, on Adobe Connect, and so they'll get the announcement from the email or the listserv, and then the, it will link them back to the Adobe Connect registration. And we have it so it's, it automatically accepts everyone who registers. And then um, this helps us record the registration numbers, who's attending, um, and if it's maybe a week out and our registration numbers aren't um, as high as we had expected, we might um, make another email blast or push it a little bit harder on social media. Great, thanks. Um, how about how about Julie? Sure. Um, well, I think probably some of the people on the webinar have seen Field of Dreams and the famous line from that movie, <laughs> if you build it, they will come. But of course, that is not true with webinars. You can create the greatest webinar, but people will not just magically find it. Uh, you definitely have to get it out there. And I think one of the important things to keep in mind as you're advertising is, is really knowing the objectives of the webinar and knowing who your target audience is. Um, those will help you define where you're going to, uh, to advertise and who you're going to ask to join. Um, so for the AgriLinks webinars, we, we typically send out two invitation emails uh, to our 12,000 person mailing list. Uh, so that gets us really the bulk of the uh, participation. But I think really importantly, we always ask our uh, presenters to advertise to their networks and their lists. And that has a higher rate of return than just our big email blast. Uh, because if, if you have that personal invitation, 
um, from someone who knows you might actually be interested in this webinar, I think that's really good at converting people to registering and attending. And then, of course, one of the keys is the reminder email sent the day before. Um, I know I've come to expect that when I register for a webinar, and if that wasn't sent out, I'd, I'd almost be like, is this webinar even happening? Um, so I think that's an expectation now that you get that day before reminder email that sends you right into the webinar. Or sometimes people send it out, of course, maybe only an hour before the webinar uh, to trigger people to actually attend. And I think that helps with the higher kind of rate of people who registered actually attending the webinar. Great. Um, I, I would add that we've also started um, to, you know, proactively um, get those who did get that forwarded from whatever, you know, list server, what have you, to join for the next one um, because otherwise, you know, you're, you're getting those people one time, but they may not, you know, subscribe on their own to, to come back. So those those are great opportunities when you're sort of, you know, getting getting people in through a, a different, uh, um, got, Maria? <laughs> um, we've got a different, uh, <laughs> um, sub, you know. Um, yeah, well, uh, I, I think we got a video oh. issue here. But I, I would concur. Um, a good portion of yeah, our I'm attendees um, are people who have never attended before. I, I'd say we have a lot of repeat customers for AgriLinks webinars, but we also have always somebody who's never attended before. And we all, all sometimes think, gosh, where did they hear about this from? Um, so of course we have the question, where did you hear about this webinar from? Uh, but as April was mentioning, it is a good opportunity to get those new people who are joining your webinar for the first time then subscribed to your mailing list. So kind of don't pass up that chance to say, hey, you're on this webinar, I want to subscribe to our list as well. Great, thank you for finishing my thought there. <laughs> um, so I think also, let's see, uh, Peter, did you, do you have something you wanted uh, to, to add to uh, this question? Well, uh, apart from the fact that um, um, announcing a party and organizing a party and nobody shows up is probably one of the most frustrating things you can do being a party organizer and a webinar is not different. Um, we, uh, we follow, um, and this question's coming in on the, the process to follow, and there's lots of things to say about this, but what we do is we publish an announcement post which um, contains all of the background info, speaker profiles, admin info, uh, registration details, minimum two weeks before, and then, as, as some other people have said, spread it either uh, to our mailing list, uh, so we keep all of the people who participated in at least one past webinar in a database, and normally already a, a broadcast, this is a list now of 2,000 people, uh, one broadcast to that group is good enough uh, already to get uh, 100, 150 subscriptions. And then, like the other speakers, we spread it a bit via Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, but we also um, are connected to specific um, um, mailing lists or Google groups or Facebook groups of our target audience, and we spread it in there. So in general, um, we don't really have an issue in finding uh, the public. Um, our scope is rather small with, with GFR. So when we have, uh, as we have now, 85 through online, for us this is already a big uh, webinar, but as we're growing, um, uh, probably we can expand uh, on that. Uh, one thing on the registration, Funny enough, um, when people have to register by typing in their email address, like via a Google form or a, um, a survey monkey, my observation has been that 10% of the people who register via a form fill in the wrong email address. <laughs> so we added now a second line to confirm their email address mm -hmm. because it's frustrating. You have people who subscribe um, and you can't reach them simply because they made a typo in the, uh, in the email address. Um, so that's a bit of my my tip on on how to get an uh, an audience. Great, thank you. Um, we've uh, got some interesting questions coming in, um, and uh, wanna wanna pause to um, to handle a couple of those. One um, is on um, the the uh, bandwidth question and how you manage in low bandwidth situations. If there are some tools that are better than others, or, or ways that can um, you know, make a webinar more accessible for, for all because, um, you know, most of us are trying to reach global audiences and, you know, even um, just on the panel here, we have some people reaching um, in very remote situations um, where people might be actually, you know, paying data to <laughs> to attend, so it, it does matter. Um, who, who wants to take that one on?
I can start us off. Um, one of the things that I mentioned in the in the chat to Maria who asked about it is one of the things that we were doing with people that were in the Amazon was encouraging, for example, our partner organizations to um, for people to come together into one space to to attend together. So they would join on a computer that was connected via an Ethernet cable. And then there would be, you know, five people in the room and they could project it and watch together. And one person would be responsible for, you know, typing in the questions that anyone had in the room. And that was something that worked fairly well so that there would only be required one stable internet connection. Um, and we did some, you know, reaching out to specific people in the process of defining what platform we were even going to use beforehand, knowing that we needed to connect people in, in remote connection, in remote locations. But I think if people can be off Wi-Fi and on a cable connection, it makes a huge difference oftentimes where, um, where the internet is not stable. Great tips. Thanks. Um, anyone, anyone have anything they'd like to add to that? So April, I can, if I can just add that what the university has done, um, we've created hubs um, we, for the university and in the residencies for the um, doctors and the residents. And we've created um, stable network points where they can go and then connect to the Wi-Fi's. So that's what, how, what we've done to encourage participation because um, the, using a 3G or relying on 3G connection as a backup is often not an uh, option. And Wi-Fi is also often not an option, especially in the more remote areas. So that is what the university has done to try and assist the students in combating this bandwidth technology issue. Great. Um, thanks, Leandra. Um, we've, we've got another uh, question, um, uh, or I guess the, the uh, chat box has been busily discussing this whole question of, of the chat versus kind of the, the main presentation and, and how the chat box can be overwhelming. Um, it can mean multitasking, um, pros and cons, I guess. Um, so I guess kind of how do you how do you make the best of both worlds without sort of distracting from the main attraction anyone want to speak to that yeah, i can go really quickly <clears throat> i love 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 the chat box myself and i'm a big proponent of having a chat box in the webinar um, i've attended some before where there is no chat feature at all which i've always found a little bit strange or where the chat feature is entirely one way um, with just being able to submit questions to the presenters, but not being able to talk to the other participants. And that always disappoints me because that to me is one of the things that makes webinars really special and unique and different from an in-person event or just a conference call is the fact that you can network and um, talk to the other participants, share links and resources, um, you know, feed off of other people's questions and comments. To me, that's a really great value but I completely understand why some people find it distracting from the main presentation. And so um, as a facilitator, we always uh, remind people that there's usually a way to create a full screen um, version of the webinar so that you can just take the chat box out of the equation and only watch the presentation. And we definitely have people taking advantage of that. Um, to me, that's the main way of, of reducing the distraction of the chat box because I would never recommend that you simply downplay the chat box. I'd say, if anything, you want to up, up play it and keep people talking. It really is a, a great added value. So just reminding people how to get rid of it um, is a key for me. And yeah, certainly it sometimes can be a little bit distracting, but I think that the pros outweigh the cons. Thanks. Any, any other tips or thoughts on that, 
from others? Um, just a quick comment here, Pierre Andrea. Um, again, fully agree with, with Julie. I think uh, uh, chat is the first way participants can interact, so it should be as open as possible, and it should be really up to participants to make of the chat what they think is best to do with it. Uh, some, of course, some application allow some webinar or web conference application allow you to have a Q and A module, right? So you could uh, that would allow you to single out just a question, right, and have uh, the, the question and single out while the conversation remains into the chat. Um, to me, that's, there is a bit of trade-off there because it's yet another channel that you have to manage uh, and look at. Um, and yes, you might lose some dynamics that you have otherwise in an open chat. So I, I tend, yes, uh, to, to do as, uh, as Julie was suggesting, to have just an open chat. And yeah, deal with the chaos. Yes, it can be distracting. Uh, you need to be able to multitask, which I'm not. So if I read the chat, I it's very difficult to focus on the conversation for me personally, but yeah, that's the world we the world we're living in when we talk about webinars, I guess. So it's a matter of also getting used to it. Mm -hmm. oh, Over to you. And Martha. if it's all right, um, if I just chime in with one more one more piece on that, it also I think depends on the number of participants that you have. I've been on a webinar with um, with about 400 participants, and the chat was so busy that you actually couldn't even keep track um, of anything happening. So there really is a happy medium, and there may be an argument for also, you know, getting to know your own audience, but perhaps capping webinar participants at maybe 200, something that can create a, man uh, a manageable chat box. Super, thanks. Um, we, we have a couple um, of questions or, or comments, I guess, or, around using um, WhatsApp for webinars. Does anyone on the panel have experience uh, integrating WhatsApp into their webinars? Interesting idea, anyhow. Um, um, uh, April, uh, I think um, um, WhatsApp um, or going Viber or going um, Skype is, is a great way uh, when you have a smaller group um, to connect uh, people. Um, the problem that we have, and you also see this um, uh, in this webinar now, although it is a more controlled environment, um, when you have a larger community is that people need to be really disciplined uh, when you use more open chat tools um, of keeping themselves muted. Uh, otherwise, um, the background noise from um, everyone is just uh, overwhelming um, and you can't have really a, a good conversation. Uh, again, with uh, pure uh, chat tools like, like WhatsApp or uh, Skype in a way, uh, Viber in a way, um, uh, would be to have a super good uh, facilitation. Um, otherwise, if you have this in larger communities of uh, 50 or 100 people, there's a lot of chaos um, in the interaction. Uh, what I have found, though, is that in more and more um, um, countries with um, less of a bandwidth available, that people love to, have to use WhatsApp. Um, this might be WhatsApp in real time, uh, voice, uh, but also WhatsApp groups uh, to exchange uh, messages, which brings us slightly off from the webinar uh, topic. Uh, but WhatsApp um, community groups um, of uh, chat groups um, uh, through text um, uh, becomes more and more um, um, uh, popular. Uh, but I would still put this in a different category than, than, than uh, WhatsApp. Certainly, if you want to, to have a webinar with a larger community, like one we have uh, today, for me, it would be very difficult to organize via WhatsApp. Go ahead, April. Super, thanks. Um, so uh, we've got a, a little shy or a little more than 20 minutes left here. Um, I unfortunately uh, not able to follow the chat myself, but um, but do encourage everyone to, to, to keep the questions coming. We might be able to do fit in uh, one more. Um, but I do have a couple of uh, key questions here. I want to make sure that we get through. And one is on how you measure um, success of a webinar. Um, and, um, you know, I, um, I would sort of enlarge that also to, to, to be, how, you know, how do you, you know, if, you're, if you have a, a larger objective for this than kind of just getting one-way information out there, how do, how do you, or, or is there a way that you can sort of look at how people use the information down the line, which is, um, I mean, obviously, we're not doing these webinars for webinars' sake. We really want people to take away um, information and knowledge and, and use it or make connections that um, then um, serve some greater purpose. So, um, so Peter, since you're, you're, you're already up and running, let's, let's hear from you on this one. Um, well, there is the, the pure figures and, and um, um, amount of 
of dot dot dot. Um, so the pure objective figures would be um, the amount of times that, for instance, the announcement post was read, which measures the performance of our outreach and trying to get subscribers. The amount of subscribers, uh, uh, typically with GFAR, um, we're happy with a minimum of 100. Um, if we more have more than 150, it's cool. This is a typical environment that we work in. The amount of online participants, um, strangely enough, uh, it looks like um, uh, we have far less um, actual um, real-time participants always than subscribers. Uh, normally, it's uh, between 25 and 50 percent of the actual subscribers who appear online. Uh, also, the retention rate, um, like this webinar started uh, with 60 people online. Um, we had the peak of uh, 86 and we're still at 80. Um, so, how many people stay until the end? Um, we also calculate the viewer minutes in total. Um, how many minutes was this webinar viewed? Which um, let, let's just calculate if people actually tune in, watch for 10 minutes, and then it's not interesting and they leave. Uh, so a measure of, of how interesting we bring this is, is the amount of viewer um, uh, minutes. Um, that would be our main measures. Um, um, but also ready to the chat, the activity in the chat uh, channel, the quality of the questions that we have um, uh, for us are, are important. Um, uh, I, I emphasize um, on the previous question, April, uh, uh, through the chat channel, through the interaction from the audience, the audience really gets out what they want. They can ask questions which are in their specific uh, environment um, important and they want to know. That's also why for every single webinar that we do, we do a follow up. Um, we go through after the webinar, we, do, we go through all of the questions, we flag those that were not answered. Uh, we uh, patched, uh, we um, uh, email them to the um, to the presenters. Each of them uh, answers what they can answer, and then we do this as a follow-up email. Uh, uh, part of the quality of a believer is the webinar doesn't end at the webinar. It ends when all of the questions which were answered, uh, which were um, um, uh, asked, were answered. Uh, go ahead, April. Great, thanks. Um, picked up some new ideas on metrics there. Um, let's see. How about Kath Lee? Kathleen, tell us about uh, how you measure performance. Yeah, so similar to what Peter said, um, we're really looking at um, kind of hard metrics and more subjective metrics. And so definitely the number of people that have registered, um, the amount of time that they're spending in the webinar, um, those are really important too. But I think one of the best ways, at least in real time while you're conducting your webinar, is that chat box um, or the questions that are being asked. And so a really engaged audience is um, a really good sign that you have an interesting topic and it's something that people really care about um, and they're, um, the speakers kind of feed off that two-way dynamic. Um, so that's definitely something that we look for when we're putting together our webinars or we're conducting our webinars. Um, something that we have played around with, we haven't done too much with it yet, so I'm still kind of doing my own research on it, is how to use social media. Um, afterwards and perhaps during, we haven't done too much during, but to come up with a hashtag or, um, you know, how much are people sharing your post-webinar messages, um, and we always, as I'm sure everybody does, record our webinars and share those recordings um, if it's something that we're doing externally. Um, so how often is that being shared? We can look at um, metrics that way. And then if we're doing a training, or especially usually when we do something internally, we'll send out a post-webinar survey to just see um, if it was meeting our participants' needs. Super, thanks. Uh, Julie? Uh, sure. So we, we track many of the same things uh, that were just mentioned. Uh, one thing we also do, um, we've decided to do, rather than sending out a, a survey in an email afterwards, we kind of bake that into the webinar itself by about 10 or 15 minutes before the webinar ends, when most of the participants are still online, we'll put up some ending polls that ask similar questions to what we would otherwise ask in a survey. And we, we think that putting it up during the webinar um, helps get more uh, participation in those poll questions. And we'll ask things like, um, you know, or whether they can apply this to their work, which of course is taking their just opinion about that, but it's still good to know whether people can affirm uh, that they think this is applicable to their work. And then we also ask them to type in their top takeaway from the webinar, which I've always found to be really interesting to know. What is that one nugget that they're taking away? It's not, you know, necessarily a objective 
you know, measurable piece of information, but it helps us feed in, know whether what our original objectives for the webinar were, whether those um, were effective at getting information across. And then um, we have, you know, it, it is really hard, I think, to tell whether the webinar, it, it's kind of the holy grail. Can we really tell if it's improving programs out in the field? Can we tell, you know, if it's meeting those higher level objectives of, um, of being incorporated into people's work? And so a, a while back, we did actually do a series of phone calls to participants in AgriLinks webinars. Um, to do a, a little kind of mini evaluation by asking them, you know, six months down the line, um, whether they could provide some examples of how they used it in their work. And we mostly would get stories and anecdotes, um, but finding those stories and anecdotes to be useful in helping us, um, you know, determine what we're, what else we're going to do going forward to improve our webinars. Um, Yes, and then um, let's see, I think a few other things that are uh, just quickly interesting to help track performance are downloads of um, uh, any resources that are in the webinar itself or views of the webinar recording are interesting to track. And then uh, we also just love to see what countries people are joining from. Um, I always think it's an incredible success when we have 30 or more different countries around the world uh, tuning in for a webinar. It's, it's just exciting to know that it really is a, a global event and we're bringing people together. Great. Um, well, you mentioned takeaways, and I think um, that's that's also just as a, a you know a learning device too to ask your participants. Okay, reflect for a second. You know, what did you take away from that? That sort of helps solidify the learning, um, and it's actually a good uh, segue to our our our, our last uh, potentially last. We might be able to fit in one more question, which is sort of takeaways for for webinars. Uh, what are your golden tips? And uh, I'll start with you since you're already online here. Oh, sure. Um, well, of course, one of my golden tips was a focus on key takeaways um, and encouraging the presenters to make at least one of their slides a key takeaway slide. I know a lot of presenters already do that, but not everyone thinks to. Um, so we kind of enforce that with all of our presenters to have that key takeaways slide and, and all, just generally that less is more, that really the, the less you convey to someone, the more they will actually remember. Um, which is very hard in when people are trying to report out on their, their research or their programs and want to give you every single detail. So we try and rein in our presenters that way. Um, I'd say my other key tip is just that audience engagement is key. We've already talked about that, um, but that it really is about the audience and finding ways to interact, engage, um, you know, pull conversation and chat out of the audience is really what makes, I think, a top-notch webinar. And then, of course, always having backup plans. If one presenter, um, if you have a panel of three presenters and one is in a dicey uh, bandwidth area and you know that there's a possibility of maybe you'll lose them, um, you know, have a backup presenter who uh, could step in for that person. So having that, that type of backup plan ready to go in advance, I think, is helpful. Great. Yeah, having, having the discipline not to try to cram too much in and, and enforcing that on presenters who, you know, may be reluctant to let go of a few slides. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, thanks. How about uh, over to you, Pierre? Uh, thanks, April. Um, yes, to me, well, great part or one of the great parts of the success of a webinar is really in the preparation. So in the way you prepare your speakers, as we said before, in the way you design it. So make sure that you spend enough time on preparation. There are, uh, it's uh, sometimes it might take longer than uh, than you would expect. Uh, in my experience, it's very useful to start with checklists. So I have a checklist when I have to set up a webinar and I go through it and I expand my checklist as my webinar practice evolves, right? Uh, same goes for templates. If you have a series of standard templates that you can use, you know, it will save you a lot of time in preparation and uh, um, that they will, they will really come in handy. Um, so the preparation, it's really, it's really the key uh, and the participation is the key. So in your design and in your practice, um, in the running of the webinar, make sure that you have really plan for interactive moments so the the participation is built into the into the design uh, and there are different ways to do it um, and while you do that uh, i think you also coach the participants in uh, the in participating effectively in an online environment so it's the learning about uh, the subject of the webinar but it's also the learning about how to interact uh, with other 
present other speakers and uh, and the audience. Uh, so it's really the practice of participation that to me uh, that I value I value a lot uh, and uh, that yeah as I said it should be built into the design uh, of uh, of the event. And of course yes pray that the technology you know stays there. Um, yeah. <laughs> They're very unpredictable. So the things yeah. that you said before, you know, the computer running the download at the last minute or the speaker not sending you the presentation. I'm hearing myself twice. I have a bit of an echo. So yes, pray that everything yeah. uh, uh, goes well and that your speaker send you uh, your their presentation on time. Great, Over. thanks. Thank you. Yeah, you're having kind of automating what you can with templates and, um, you know, a checklist, that sort of thing. Um, once you've done a lot of these, really saves a lot of time. Um, how about uh, Kathleen? Um, yeah, so uh, I think the number one tip I would have for webinars is to um, to be prepared, as, as prepared as you can. And so I think that starts with knowing why you're doing this webinar and what your goals are. Um, and so once you have that, I think it makes the planning process um, maybe not easy, but at least you know where you're going and when you're working with uh, multiple presenters, you can really help to guide them. Um, and then, as everyone has said, practice, practice, practice. Um, make sure that you have those presentations beforehand. Uh, make sure that you have contingency plans because um, I've had very few webinars where absolutely nothing has gone wrong. So making sure that you have a plan for when something goes wrong is really helpful. Super, thank you. Um, Amy, what would you like to add to the conversation? Um, I think many of the things that I had prepped, people have mentioned, but um, I think what um, Kathy just said about the making sure that the webinar is the right tool, that it's actually the right medium for what you're trying to achieve is where I think it's important to start. Um, and then oh. as, everyone pretty much has mentioned always having a backup plan and being incredibly prepared there's a saying in spanish that um when you're there's high stress you get green you get green white hairs <laughs> and i always say that i always say that webinars create lots of green white hairs because they require a lot of um focus and attention during them and so the more you're prepared the less green white hairs you're going to get. And one of the things that I do um, to feel like there's a better backup plan is that my the person that is moderating the chat with me is always located in a different um, on a different um, network. So mm -hmm. most times this person I was in Quito and this other person was in Lima, Peru. Um, so we were always on a different network and that was really reassuring that we had someone always there on a different network that if my internet went out which happened or if her internet went out which happened we were you know there was someone there and there was someone to pick up the slack so the other thing that i think um that adds to the conversation is it's important to always continue to learn and recalibrate strategies so it, it, with regards to the time of day with regards to like the advanced time of when you're reminding people, when you're sending out an email reminder for people to connect in um, with our audience in Latin America, we ended up starting to do a, an hour reminder and a 10 minute reminder. Mm -hmm. um, and we found we got a lot more people logging in. So those were just adjustments we made along the way and things we tried and and um, different, you know, strategies that you're you're trying along the way. So, okay. great, thanks. Yeah, that's a that's a good point um, too. It's kind of it's it's great to sort of kind of get your uh, your your system and your process down, but you know, to kind of keep experimenting too, because um, yeah, you can always reach more people better um, in different ways and. Um, especially when you can do that testing and, and have those metrics to kind of see what works. And it's always hard to really, you know, attribute that um, because, I mean, we've seen, you know, very different numbers sometimes with different types of presentations and you don't know if it's the presenter or something different that you did. But um, 
but great to kind of keep experimenting and iterating and, and seeing what works. Um, so we, we did have um, a couple of other uh, questions. Um, and maybe, you know, we, those of us who have been doing this for a long time, kind of take it for granted, but um, just how much time is involved, um, what you need to, to budget um, to put on a webinar, and I, I would add to uh, for presenters so that they know what they're getting into and that they're signing off on um, whatever um, time required um, to, uh, to do their part. Uh, Peter, did you want to speak to that? Um, sure. Um, I think there's two time budgets um, uh, involved in here is one for the person who's involved from the very beginning, getting the speakers, uh, getting the content, um, um, writing the blog post, let's say the, the, the more the master facilitator, all the way up to the wrap up emails and gathering answers from um, um, questions left unanswered during the webinar itself. So for that, to give you a ballpark figure, we calculate between seven and 10 days it takes. Um, it also depends on hmm. the amount of speakers you have, uh, the amount of presentations you have. Uh, but for an average um, a webinar, as let's say the master facilitator from the very beginning, the first email saying, hey, Amy, would you be uh, interested in doing a webinar here? <laughs> All the way up to the last closing email, um, seven to 10 days. Uh, I would assume per presenter, uh, probably depending if there is presentations to be, um, uh, uh, to be made, PowerPoints to be made, probably anything between you know, half a day or a day, knowing that the webinar itself already takes more or less an hour and a half, two hours. So probably um, um, a, a day um, um, full time to uh, to participate. Um, that's my input. Um, uh, go ahead, Tebra. Great, thanks. Yeah, I, I imagine many people would, would underestimate that because uh, you there, there are a lot of steps involved. Um, does anyone have a, a different uh, estimate, a wildly different estimate um, or thought on, on the time required? Um, we, they all we agree also, with me, April. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you'll guess how many jelly beans are in the jar. It's a, it's a hard question. But, uh, so uh, there, there was also a, a question around um, process and steps. Um, and I, um, given that we're short on time, I, I think it could be interesting maybe uh, if the uh, panelists are willing to to share a checklist that, that kind of outlines their, their process. Um, maybe that's something we could share out with uh, participants afterwards, Peter? Um, yep, um, the question is open to the, the rest of the presenters, of course. Um, if they have um, a process document that outlines a bit the different roles uh, in preparing and delivering a webinar, um, and more or less a, a time estimate, I will definitely, from our end, from GFAR, um, and this is one of the um, uh, the GFAR slash GLF uh, webinars. Um, I will give you the back the back end um, document that we follow and where we tick off uh, for every single uh, webinar that we are preparing or are delivering all the different uh, steps. So you'll see the different roles, um, the timeline. So we know, okay, we're now one month before the webinar. Where do we need to be? Uh, we're 14 days before the webinar. Where do we need to be? And the things that we need to do up to one hour or 30 minutes before the webinar itself. Um, um, so that would give people a, a little bit of a guidance on the process itself. That's what we can do from GFAR. I don't know if any of the other presenters would have this. Uh, email them to me and I can distribute them to the subscribers. Great. Well, uh, this has been a really rich conversation. Um, I know I've learned a few things and um, um, I know this is being recorded too, so people can also go back and review this, share it out. Um, I thank you for uh, the opportunity, Peter, to, to convene us all on this topic. I'll turn this back over to you. I'm, I'm putting my other hat now on <laughs> as the uh, somewhere the facilitator. Well, thanks, of course, um, um, uh, first of all, for the speakers and the audience. Um, I have one golden takeaway tip um, for the audience. Don't get overwhelmed. Um, you know, in principle, organizing a webinar is reasonably simple. Um, and it's reasonably straightforward, um, but start small. The first webinars that we did um, some years ago for CGR and, and for GFAR, I think we had 20 participants um, or 30 participants, and we were happy. Um, um, nowadays, we're going into you know, 400, 500 subscribers, but you cannot do this from day one. So if you, um, as um, um, a participant, if you are looking to 
use webinars um, in your work environment, start um, small, start with simple tools, um, start with just a few speakers, um, uh, start with um, um, you know, 10, 20 people and build up your experience. Um, what you've seen now from us um, as, the, um, um, as a panelist, you see the end result of probably five, six, seven years of online moderation. So don't get discouraged. Um, um, start small, experiment, um, and gradually grow. Um, and you will learn as you go along um, as a facilitator on the technical aspects. Um, um, and I will also share some of the, um, um, the, the surveys that we've done of webinar tools, uh, a test that we've done um, a couple of years ago. So you see at least when you're looking at a tool at what aspects um, you need to look at, uh, including connectivity, complexity um, uh, on downloading the, um, the app or the plugin, et cetera, et cetera. As promised, um, um, I will distribute a link to the recording um, of this webinar, um, normally within 24 hours. Uh, we will also list, as promised, all of the questions which were clearly not uh, fully answered during the webinar itself. Um, and um, I will come back to the subscribers of this webinar within about a week uh, with an overview of the answers. We're currently preparing our last GFAR uh, webinar before Christmas, uh, which will cover uh, innovative annual reports that dread a job which deep down in their hearts all the communications people really hate. Um, this will be the first week of December and then we have a couple of upcoming uh, GLF digital summits covering landscape approaches and youth in landscapes um, as part of the GLF global event uh, we, ho we hold in Bonn on December the 19th and the 20th as an example again of how webinars can be used to prepare um, actual events and conferences. Thank you again, um, uh, da um, David, uh, in the background, assembling all the questions. Um, thank you, April, uh, for moderating, and thank you all the speakers for joining us today, and all of you, um, our online audience, and I hope we will see you soon again, and I can work with you guys again. Thank you very much, and see you next time.